How do you release faith? As you speak the word. How do you release faith in your life? You speak the word. I don't want to just be hearing it. I want to release it. I want to release it into my life. Who told you you weren't righteous? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you that he wouldn't bless you coming and going? Who told you that he didn't justify you? Who told you that there hasn't been an exchange? It's all a lie of the enemy. of giving you the Holy Spirit that will lead and guide and let you know that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I've given you the Holy Spirit to tell you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I've given you the Holy Spirit that says you cannot fail if you're looking unto me. Don't worry about the good Samaritan. I mean, we've all heard that all of our lives. But and I'm not trying to... I just want to encourage you today. I want to do a little bit of... I want to preach, but I want you to leave here with some freedom in your mind and in your heart today. Because we don't realize how good we got it. Can I say that again? We don't realize how good we've got it. We've got an old paradigm way of thinking. And we've been saved by grace... But yet we live under an old paradigm like the world lives. We just try to act and respond like the world does to everything. But it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I say that over and over because it amazes me the more, the more that I continue to, to read and to study and to pray, that he keeps renewing my mind. He keeps renewing my mind. And it's an ever-ongoing process. But I don't want to just say the process is, you know, I'm in, I'm, he's already saved you and redeemed you. He's already made you sons and daughters. Don't serve because I want to be a son. I serve because I am a son or a daughter. And you see the difference in that. And we spend all of our lives, we're saved by grace, but then we live like the world does and we live under the curse. Mindset, a poverty mindset, a lack mindset, a not good enough mindset. Not, I'm never going to, one of these days I'll make it to the by and by. Instead of realizing he paid a price for you that you could live life and live now and live in the abundant life of who he is now and, and grow in that eternal inheritance and eternal redemption and it keeps getting better and better. It says Jesus is the, as came as the covenant of better things to come. I don't know about you, but I want to experience the better things to come. Let me say that again. It says Jesus came, Jesus came as the high priest of better things to come. Of better things. How many here like better? How many here like worse? Better things to come. And as we renew our mind, as, a, as the Lord shared with me about the about the uh, the Good Samaritan, and he showed, he took me all through a journey of the Bible of, of the priests and the Levites. And, and I don't know if anybody can see this, but how many here how many here have heard of priests and Levites? I mean, have heard of Samaritans? And I just want to share. Uh, uh, let me give you a social picture here, and I'm going to draw this out. This was the priest. You can't see. I'll show it to you in a minute. So just just follow along. This is the priest. This was the Levite. This was the Jew. This was, this was the, uh, the tax collector, the outcast. This, then the outer circle here then was, this was the Samaritan. And then on this other circle, guess what? This was the Gentile and the social status. I know my drawing's not as good, but so for you to see over here, do you see priest, Levite, Jew, tax collector, outcast, are you following the social picture? Are you getting the picture here? And here's us. Here's and Jesus in the in the in the in the Judea, the one who was the study of the law. What must I do to inter, inherit eternal life? He gives the right answer. But let me ask you: Did anyone fulfill that in their life? No, everyone failed. Everyone failed. Put up Romans three, twenty-two and two twenty-four. But everyone failed. But praise God for Jesus who came to be of better things to come. He says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've heard this before. But watch the next verse. I love this part. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified freely. How did you and I, how did your name get written in the Lamb's book of life? How did you obtain relationship to sons and daughters? Through, through believing. How did, you, how did you obtain favor and right standing with God? Believing that with Jesus, the compassion. Believing the finished work of what Jesus Christ did. At, not just at the cross, but at his resurrection. He didn't just shed his blood. His shed his blood was to wash your sins away. 
but his resurrection was to empower you and I to live the amazing grace that's been bestowed in our life. Amen? Amen? And sometimes in this, I want you, in this story, the social status, this was pretty important at that time and age. It was pretty important at that time of age because the priest was the one who had the answer to it all. Priests was the chosen ones of God. They were the ones that declared you clean or unclean. Woo! Where are we going with this, preacher? And I say this to you, when you read the story, one of the things that amazes, that amazes me as I go through it, he says, you have answered right, we do this and you will live. Has anyone ever been able to fulfill other than Jesus? And I'm not trying to go, woo, but I'm trying to tell you, you didn't get the Holy Spirit in you so you can go back and do all this. You got the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that it's only through Jesus Christ and it's Jesus Christ that empowers you. It's, in Jesus, it's in through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability over Sin, and it gives you that right, and it gives you the awareness that you are right, you are in favor with God through Jesus Christ. Holy cow! But to that era, that was hard for them to accept. And the Lord showed me this years ago when we go out witnessing to people. And why are so many, Why is it so hard for people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? You know, we like the crooked road. We like it to be rough and tough and tell us how to get there. And when we got to the end, we go, man, did you see all those curves I came through? You know, I drive Rick. The first time Rick took me on a boat ride at the river, I was was dating Shauna, and I thought he was out to kill me. I remember riding that boat and throwing my leg up. I grew up on Lake Erie. We just, you just drove a boat wherever you wanted to go. Never drove on a, on a river. And I remember when I was riding with him, driving down that river, I thought, these people were crazy. And I threw my leg over and thought we was going to crash on that gravel bar an inch you are, and he just drove right over it. You laugh, but I wasn't really. And then he had, his, and he had his gun with him, too. He said we're going squirrel hunting. <laughs> but. I got so excited about the story, I don't know where I was going with it now. <laughs> the curvy road. The curvy road. But here, let me ask you this. Sometimes we think that we've accomplished something. But I want to encourage you today. How many here, like he says, he'll make the crooked road straight? I don't know about you, but I want to go on a straight path. I want to see a straight path from A to B. The simplest way to do it, and the simplest way to do it is believing and receiving in who Jesus Christ is in your life. I want the straight way, and sometimes go, oh, that's too easy. It's too easy just to believe and to receive. It says those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will just come to church on Sunday. No, it says they'll rule and reign in life as kings and priests. Those who receive. It didn't say achieve. Those who receive. So what's what's our biggest thing in this? Is to receive his goodness and his grace and let it transform and renew how we walk and how we talk and how we live and how we act and how we do through the Holy Spirit empowering us and showing us the way, the truth, and the life. Are you getting this this morning? Are you excited? And we have to tear down some old paradigm and some old thinking that Jesus came with a new and, and a new and better way. And we start to start receiving and walking in and asking the Holy Spirit to continue showing me the new and better way. Can I give you a real short example of that? A personal one? I got a bug flew in my, flew in my ear this, this, this week. And it got into my ear, and I went to the ER, and I sent, it was a Tuesday night, I was in the ER from 11 o'clock till 4.30 in the morning with a bug in my ear. And it, and it was attached to my eardrum. So every time they would go to pull the bug, guess what they were pulling on? And then the guy tells the doctor, says, we liken this to childbirth and kidney stones. And I'm holding on to this thing, and I'm just, and I'm holding, I mean, I'm sweating like a horse and running down, my eyes are watering, and and there's a, then they told me this lady was a doctor in training, intern, and she was just a little short, short little lady, and I was in so much pain, and just sitting there, oh, Jesus, I, you know, and that lady, she walked over, and she kept wanting to touch my arm, you know how, you know how they, how they do, she, I'd be, oh, and she'd, she'd try, hope that she would do that. And, and finally, she just grabbed hold of my arm and just said, it's going to be okay. But I just got to, but, but, uh, you get, you laugh. You know what he tried to do? And he, we did this at the house before I went. They took a vacuum cleaner and stuck it to my ear. <laughs> uh, you guys all laugh. I, I had to experience this. 
<clears throat> how will that preach? So I go, so all this is going on. I finally, whatever they did, and then Shauna poured some kind of, she's into the oil thing, <laughs> put it into the house. You know, I got a little sneeze. Put this under your nose, and it feels like somebody lit a match underneath your nose for a couple. Of, now, if you got the oil things, I'm not picking on you. But I don't know what she put in my ear, but when she put it in my ear, I did the Indian dance of how to put out the fire because it just set on fire, and, and then I couldn't get away from the pain. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, I walked in. I'm putting on my britches, and she, I had shorts on. And she says, uh, and she says, what are you doing? I said, I am taking myself to the hospital. Do not worry about it. I will call you when this is all done. So I drive up there and I walk in. I'm, I walk in. I made the fastest trip to, anyhow. Let just let. It's the little things in life that we don't realize that just get us all off kelter. Do you hear that? And here's what I want to share with you. Then Shauna, Then the next day, we've had a week of going to the doctor. Then the next day, Shauna Nordia. They thought she broke her arm at school, so she takes her to see Miss Danielle over here. And Danielle recommends to Shauna that I go to see an ears and nose and throat doctor. So now I get home, and they gave me a shot. And I don't know what the kind of shot they gave me, but it was a shot. And then they told me, you ought not drive home. <laughs> so I'm having a weird, so I get home, and I get home, and I'm just, how you feel? I was, right now, I feel pretty good. So I sleep it off, and I wake up, and she goes, you got an appointment at the so here's what I'm trying to say is the ER, the ER, I hurried up and ran to something. And you know what that lady told me? She said, all I did was mutilate me. They mutilated the inside of my ear. And she had the right stuff. And, you know, and I, I should have known when a guy had that little light like you do when you go to see. And he's trying to hold that and reach in there and trying to get me to hold my head. And she walks in. She's got this monster looking thing. I just sit down and she looks at her and, gets, and I told her, I said, I'm allergic to pain. And I said, if you have to go in and if I have to experience anything like I did last night, I said, knock me out, please. And I was serious. I wasn't being, I said, man, mom, this is the real deal. Knock me out. I do not want to experience it because it felt like somebody driving needles in there. And then when he'd pull it out, we didn't get it. And he'd be, and, and it would still be throbbing like it was still pulling us. Anyhow, I remember grabbing the bottom. Of, here we go again. I'm going to grab the bottom of that, bottom of that bed or whatever you call it and and it did a, made a little, a little, little prick, and it was done. And she pulled it out and handed it to me. So, so what I'm trying to say is, and Shauna tried to get me to wait till the next day. <laughs> and I said, nope. And, and it's so, and I know this is a, a story, and if I can spiritualize it, sometimes when things happen, we get in such a hurry to take off running. Instead of, and I'm not saying that, and, and if I could use Shauna as a type of, sometimes just sit and wait. And listen, and I'll put you with the right ear, nose, and note doctor, ENT. And they got the right equipment to make this thing go a whole lot better. Or you can hurry up and go through and suffer a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of turmoil, which you really don't have to. And then you can go tell somebody about it, how you felt like you were having a baby and a kidney stone all at one time. And you're not built for either one of those. Or you could do that. And I thought, and I thought sometimes it's the little things that happen that we, we all of a sudden just we freak out and think we got to hurry up and go do something. And we're going to take the crooked road instead of just taking the straight road. Amen. And the straight road, like I said, peace to shalom, the straight road's a whole lot better than a crooked road. And then I thought about in the Bible when she said the word mutilate. In the Bible, Paul says, why do you let these people mutilate you? Why do you let these people put a whole bunch of rules and regulations and mutilate you? You came into this thing just by believing in Jesus Christ. Why don't you just stay there and camp there and let the Holy Spirit work on you and clean you and wash you and do things instead of being mutilated and always being at the ER begging for somebody to help you instead of just trusting that he'll lead you to the right people at the right time at the right place that has the right equipment to lead and guide and direct you so that you can continue to stay in stable, secure, and safe knowing who you are in Christ instead of having to have a whole bunch of stuff on you to get better when he says, if you just if you listen to me, I'll put you on the road. That you'll, you'll, how like, if you listen to me, I'll put you on that path that's straight. Amen? Amen? Yeah, Are you getting this this morning? But we got to change that paradigm in the way we think, in the way we act, in the way we do. We got to renew our minds to what he says about us. And I have to say that carefully. We need to renew our minds to what he says about you. And I don't say this in a condemning way or bad way, but not what the church says about you. 
and I'm all for church, but we can't let the church be who defines us. It needs to be him who defines us. And then we become that living church, that living temple, wherever we go in Jesus' name. And we become that tabernacle, that church. You know, when God told me one time, if you, he, he says, if you, if you want to be a super Walmart, I told you, a consumer Walmart, that's fine. But all they do is come in and take off the shelf, but I, they never come and hang out with me. He said, if you'll be the city on the hill, I'm the one that the whole focus is me. And he says, when you do that, then when you do that, because he says, he doesn't, tell for, he doesn't tell you and me to go build a church. He says, I will build my church. I will build Jesus. T- what would Peter say? Who do you say that I am? Well, you are the Christ. And he says, upon this, I will build my church. So I'm here to tell you, it's not our job to build a church. It's our job to flow in who we are in him and let the church that's been placed in us through Jesus Christ come and manifest wherever we go and wherever we do, not just a building here on a street corner. You are, the, you are a living representation of, of God himself through Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? You are a living representation on this world, on this planet of God himself through Jesus Christ. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. Are you excited today? So, if you understand the paradigm of the, the way this was going, the priest was the priest. He was the big dog in this. And he says he was coming along the road. And what did he do? He went on the other side. And then the Levite came. And the Levite said, what did he do? He passed by on the other side. What I'm trying to say is sometimes we look to the old paradigm. We think it has the answers. Neither one of them. They were the ones at this time that had the answers. And what did they do? They just kept right on walking. They kept right on walking. And if you go and read, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to read it this morning. If you go and read about the priest, do you know what it said? The priest, they weren't allowed to touch anything dead. So if, the Bible said he was half dead. So if he looked dead, do you think he was going to show up and go over there? He was, he was just doing what he was trained to do, what the church told him to do. So that's what he was doing. So the ones, what I'm trying to say is the old way of doing things There's no answer. There's no help in it. All it could do was demand, but it could never lift a finger. All it could do was demand, but never lift a finger. I've said that in the last few weeks. And then we got the the outcasts and the the tax collectors. We got the Jewish people, but you got those outcasts, and they weren't accepted by the Jewish people. So they went and hung out with the Samaritans. And the Samaritans, what had happened, a Samaritan was just a, they were the Israelite people that intermingled with a whole bunch of other people. And to the Jews, that was a terrible thing, and they were not accepted. They were despised. They were despised, the half-breed, looked down on. They were all a mess, and they weren't even considered to be anybody. That's the Samaritan. Well, then you got the Gentile on the outside of that, and guess who that is? That's you and me. We don't even qualify to be a Samaritan. The dogs. Think about that. Think of That's what I'm trying to tell you. Think of how amazing it is what we got and don't realize it. Think of the amazing position that we've been given in Christ and don't realize it. Think of the amazing that you have in bringing them to in a place of safety, healing, and refreshment, the refreshment that God loves them and God cares for them, will never leave them nor forsake them. And think of the amazement that you carry the antidote. His name is Jesus. He wants to take your ordinary life and turn it into sweet, sweet wine. Think of that. And you get to plant seeds of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection. Isn't that an amazing thing? And we'll flow flow through this through relationship. Oh, my goodness. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, he created man, he says, not good for man to be alone. But when he made man, he said, he's not just good, he's very good. And then when Jesus came, when Jesus came, one of the first things he did, he went about getting some friends. He went and sought some friends. He didn't come and isolate himself and do his own thing. He went about getting friends. Oh, that just jumped up in me. Well, church, church isn't doing enough. They need to be doing more about all that. You know what? Sometimes let the Holy Spirit lead you. You make a phone call, invite somebody over to your house. You have a potluck dinner at your house. Invite me, I'll come. What I'm trying to say is don't let it be the church's responsibility. Let the Holy Spirit lead and guide and direct you. God, he's all about community and getting together and talking and doing things, but it's through relationship, not out of duty. It's quiet in here. It's quiet. Are you receiving this? 
This is no beat up thing. This is something that the Samaritan, the Samaritan, he goes down here and he says, when he arrived to his place, he came and looked and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. The Samaritan was looked down. Wasn't, he was the guy that nobody, if you were a Jew, would you want the Samaritan to come help you? If you were a Jew, would you have turned around and helped the Samaritan? The answer would be no. He wouldn't do that. So what Jesus is trying to tell when that when that when that guy asked him, "Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor?" He was telling, "Which one of this group do I got to be good to?" You hear what he's saying? Which group do I appeal to? To do, do, who's my neighbor that I'm supposed to treat as myself? And he was saying, "You treat them all the same way." He treat them all the same way. See the difference there? Well, they weren't trained. They weren't showed that way. And Jesus comes on board. That really messed it all up. Who's my neighbor? We need to love the Samaritan. And, and he doesn't even call him a Samaritan. He says, that certain guy you just talked about. Because they didn't receive them. How many here in your life thought that the church didn't receive you? Or the church looked down at you because this, that, and the other. This problem, that problem, or what wasn't. They, they, they gave you a certain set of things and you didn't match up to that. So, what, so they didn't receive you. They kicked you out. I've talked to people. I know some people that would sit down in the parking lot and somebody would beat them up emotionally. And they would never go to church again. And they were coming to church seeking for help. So when you come in here today, I'm going to tell you, in Jesus Christ, you are accepted. And, and we put that, what happened to my verse up here? It says, you are justified freely. Romans, Romans. Uh, yep, and at the bottom here it says, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So who's all? Greek translation of all is all. Being justified freely by his grace. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Who justifies you when you believe on Jesus Christ? He's a just and a justifier of you. When you believed on him, guess what? You get to come in and, be, and, and you're adopted as a son and a daughter. Isn't that amazing? And you probably heard, have you heard me say that before? I've said that probably a lot of times. But it says here, it says you are justified freely. What did it cost you? What did it cost him? Everything. By his grace. What is grace? Undeserved. I'm just going to use that word. It's undeserved. You did not deserve to be justified freely. Ooh. Let that resonate in your. You did not deserve. There was nothing you could bring to the table for God that would justify you. There's nothing you could do. No matter of climbing, running, and doing will ever justify you. The only thing that would, you know, there it is. And Isaiah says, your righteousness is as filthy rags. Didn't say your sins. It says your righteousness. Whatever you try to bring before God to do, it says filthy rags. Not your sins, but your righteousness. Because you're trying to get your own righteousness instead of give, receiving the righteousness that I purchased and paid for you in the favor, in the right standing. That would that help a whole bunch of us here. Well, preacher, you preach that we can just, that great, that amazing grace sets us free. You can do whatever you want to do. Well, if that's what you're hearing, you're not hearing the whole message. You're like a dog on a chain that's always wanted to chase the ice cream truck. All you're hearing is saying, I could go chase the ice cream truck. You're hearing the wrong message. The message is you received grace. You didn't deserve it. He empowered you to be, to live over the things that have tried to harm you and hurt you. He, you, know, you, are not, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Now, I tell people that get off, that want to chase, go chase the ice cream truck because it's always been in your heart to do anyway. But you're going to find out pretty soon it, doesn't, it isn't all what it was planned, all it was what it was supposed to be. And pretty soon you're going to have to come back to where the, where the you might have been on a chain, but you're going to find that you've been set free because don't ever put, the Lord told me, don't ever put chains back on people. But always have the food, always have food in the bowl. That they're always welcome to come feed on Jesus. Woo, no, that's some strange stuff. But how many times in life we go to church, church told us how to clean up, church taught us how to clean up and look good on the outside. What to say and how to say, hello, brother, hello, sister, hello, we all live. And then the first time somebody cussed or did something out of the world, we had a freak out attack because we're so used to the bubble of brothers and sisters and kumbayas and trying to do that. And when somebody freaked, oh, my gosh, you know, Satan showed up. And it says you and I are to be the light of the world. Be the light of the world. When you're around those people, let the light of Jesus shine in them, shine in you. Don't go, ah! That's how I was. I lived five years in Bible college. I knew all the kumbayas. I went to church every day. 
Every day, five days a week, I can only miss 11. And I always would miss 11. I had free 11, and every once, I think I had to go before a committee too because I missed a few more. That was different. And I'm not trying, what I'm trying to get you to see is I've learned that life is so much more than those things. Life is about a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And then it says he's the father of the fall. When you know what another thing that amazed me here is that he calls the good Samaritan. And if you go over in John, they accuse Jesus of, heaven, of being a Samaritan and being having a demon. And he never goes and tells them that he, he never, he goes, I just want to honor my father. And then the Holy, then the Holy Spirit told me, he goes, he goes, Jesus was a Jew through his mother, but his daddy wasn't a Jew. Who's his daddy? He's the father of us all. That really blew my mind. He's the father of us, of us all. He's been making a way of acceptance all the way back from the very time he's, been, he's going to send his son so that you and I would see that we are accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in him. Uh-oh. Got a new headpiece. So, are you getting this today? And I'm going to wind this down, but I want to see that you've been justified freely. I want you to see that in life, But I want, to read, I want to read a couple things to you here because I want you to see the amazing things that you have in Christ Jesus. I want you to read, I'm going to read, a, uh, as the priest and Levites, did they have the answer? They did not have the answer. It says, in Hebrews 9, 11, it says that Christ came as a high priest of good things to come, a greater and more perfect tabernacle, and obtained eternal redemption for you and me. Eternally redeemed us, eternally brought us out. Christ came as high priest of good things to come. How many here like good things? Mm. And I'm going to read to you out of Leviticus for a moment about a priest and about, about the way some way things were viewed. Is that okay? Let me read you something about a priest here. This was Aaron. This is what it says here. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the priests and descendants of Aaron. This is in Leviticus 21. And you can go back and read it. It talks about the priest may not marry a woman defiled in prostitution. You may not marry a woman who is divorced from her husband. For the priests are set apart holy for their God. You must treat them holy because they offer, uh, they offer up food to God. And he just goes on giving a whole list on that if you want to know what the priest does. But then, he go, but then it says in, says, I think it says in 1 Peter 2.9, it says, You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You've been, you've been made, and I've talked a few weeks ago, you are, you are a, a royal priesthood in God's kingdom. You are, when we talk about those who receive the abundance of grace, will rule and reign as kings and priests. That's another one you've got to renew your mind to. But watch what he tells the, the priest here, and I really want to see, maybe this will impact some of us here today. Um, then the Lord, this is in Leviticus 21, 16, and I'm going to read out of my living Bible. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to Aaron. In all future generations, none of your descendants who has any defect will qualify to offer food to God. No one who has defect qualifies, whether he is blind, lame, disfigured, deformed, or has a broken foot or arm, or, has a, or, has a, or is hunchback or dwarfed, or has a defective eye or skin scores or, or scabs or damaged as a eunuch. No descendant of Aaron who has any defect may approach the altar. Let me read it again. No descendant of Aaron, that's the priest, that's the priest, that's the one in the social order, they're right in the center. He said, if there's any defect in them, can they come before the throne? Can they come before the altar? And then it goes on and goes toward, yet because of his physical defect, he may not enter the room behind the inner curtain or approach the altar. For this would defile my holy places. I am the Lord God who makes them holy. So I want you to see right there, I want you to see just on that verse right alone, if looking at the, we talk about the priest that was coming. If he had any defect, could he be in God's presence? And then we gave a whole list of some of the things that were shown. If he was hunchback, had a wild eye looking, had any type of a skin disease, all I want you to see here, all I want you to see here is how good you and I got it through our high priest, Jesus Christ. Through our high priest, Jesus Christ. Now, how many here have had defects? How many here have had people point out our defects? How many here know we all got defects? But how many here would read that just alone right there? How many here, how many here would have just disqualified? 
We all disqualified ourselves. Because of the way that, and you read in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, you have not come to Mount Sinai. When they were trying to approach the mountain, God said, don't have them come. Even if an animal or, or something touches it, they're going to die. So they all backed up because they couldn't come to where God was. And it says, you have come, you have come to Mount Zion the city of the living God, the holy Jerusalem, where Jesus is the mediator of a new and better covenant, a new and better way. I don't know about you, that starts to get me pretty excited because the old, you couldn't, it always demanded, and if you, got, you did something wrong, you had any defect, guess what? How would you like to live your life knowing? If you're an Israelite back then going, well, they got defects. They got a bug in their ear. They got a bug in their ear. Take them to the ER. Let's get them clean. Well, so for the priest to see that a Samaritan, it was a big deal to him. Because think, think, think of this. This is another thing the Holy Spirit told me. They couldn't touch a dead person. Now, if we still live by that, where, where's Mike? Mike's got a new liver. If we still lived by this, guess what? Mike wouldn't probably be here. That's how good he's got it that somebody else, somebody else was able to donate him a liver. And he was able to live and shine bright and look good. How many years ago was that, Mike? Thirteen. Thirteen. Woohoo! Praise God. That's amazing. Wow. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Are you getting anything out of this today? Woo. Now I'm going to go over to Hebrews. Let's just jump over to Hebrews 10, maybe 9 or 10, and we'll, we'll, start, we'll land this. We're not going to land. We're just gonna always, we always keep going. God is so good. And I'm so excited that he calls me son. I'm so excited that he loves me and cares for me. I'm so excited that he looks past. I can say this. And I'm going to read this one. We just talked about some of the priests. If you want to go back, read Leviticus, read some numbers. I mean, it is amazing in the detail. God spent a lot of detail and blueprint telling them what to do and not do. And then we'll start at verse 10, verse 11. It says, And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Verse 12 of chapter 10. But, but this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, who's this man? Jesus. Sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies may, may be made a footstool for, by one offering he has perfected forever those who, are be, those who are being sanctified. Now let me ask you this. When you receive Jesus Christ, you have been perfected in Jesus Christ. He no longer, he no longer looks at defects. He no longer is looking for defects. He's no longer looking to see if you're hunched back or got a broken arm or a, a wild-eyed looking deal or some kind of skin dysfunction or, or disorder. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's how much better we got it. And it even gets better than that. But the Holy Spirit, verse 15, also witnesses to us. The Holy Spirit, what's the Holy Spirit do? Witnesses to us. For after he had said before, and this is what he says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds. I will write, I will write them. Then he adds, now watch, then he adds, Their sins and lawless deeds I will remember on every Sunday. No more. Isn't that something to shout about? Now look at this. He remembers that stuff no more. But in the old, the old paradigm, it says if you've got any kind of defect, you're done. You're done. Won't even want you around. If you've got any defect, you're no good. And how many times today we still kind of say, we kind of see that here and there. If you get any kind of defect, everything's, everything's messed up. You know, you know I, years ago I remember my family went through a whole lot of trauma and they said, we did, they told them not to come back till they got it all right. And I remember as a little kid growing up, remembering watching the mindset of how that changed the shift of what was going on and how it traumatized and did things. They needed to go to an ENT and not be mutilated. They got mutilated not realizing if they, if they just held on. There's, there were some people that would show some, gr some mercy and grace and some compassion and some antidote and some position and some, and some safety. Instead of hacking and, hacking and pointing fingers to it and showing and pointing all the defects, you're no good. 
Well, I'm here to tell you in Christ, he says, you are good and that you are his masterpiece created to do good works. I want you to see how good it goes. He goes, he's going to remember your sins how much? How much? Now, if you're just hearing that part of it, you're missing the whole circle of what it's supposed to be. Remember what I said? He remembers in the morning and say, what means I go do whatever? You're free to do. I'm going to tell you, if I can say it just right and don't do it, you are free to do whatever. Ooh. Now to the right church, they just kicked me out. But if that's the only part of the message you're hearing, then you're not hearing the message of saved by grace. Because you're free, think of the amazing, you're free to do whatever, but because of the change in your life, you don't have to be, you, the, you are empowered to live above those things that have tried to control you and hold on to you. Do you see the difference through that relationship, through the things that's changed in my heart? I'm not who I used to be. I'm an, I, I, there's been given to me a new and living way. I've been remade and my wardrobe is, it says on it, made by G-O-D. I have been perfected in him. Amen? And when you see this, now remember the old I read about the priest. If any defect, he couldn't do any part of coming to the altar, couldn't do anything. Did I read that to you? We'll wrap this up. Watch what he says here. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holies, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new, living which, what, new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Oh, my goodness. Let us hold fast our confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Did you hear that this morning? That, makes, that just makes you want to shout. Woo! I can come boldly to the throne of grace. Did you hear the word boldly? I just read in the old paradigm of doing things, if you had any kind of dis, dis, didn't any kind of deal, you couldn't go. But Christ came for a new and living way. So what I'm trying to say, you've been perfected in ways you don't even know. You've been perfected that you and I can think about you. Think of the, think of the honor. We're the Gentiles. We're the lowest one on the chains on the social status. And we've been given, we have been given sonship and daughtership in Christ Jesus. We've been given favor with God to come boldly to a throne of grace, to come boldly and have relationship with God the Father. Not walking in backwards hoping that I sprinkle the blood that everything's going to go okay. It says you can come boldly right up to Daddy and sit on his lap. Isn't that an amazing thing that's taken place and we see it in the Bible, and, I've, and, and as, what I, as we see it, and as the Holy Spirit leads us into this, let it grab a hold of your everyday life. That we're so focused on our defects and our pains and our hurts and the, and the bug in our ear, and it, and, it, and it robs us from the good and greater things that are to come in the life that we've been given in and through Christ Jesus. Then it robs us from seeing the boldness to come to the throne of grace. It robs us from something he's already completed and finished. And he's just waiting on us to get a hold of it. Mm -mm -mm. By his will, he sanctified you. By his will, he justified you. What was his will for your life to send Jesus Christ? To save you and redeem you? Whew, I don't know if this helps you, but boy, it sure makes me want to shout. Makes me want to shout. I'm no longer despised. No longer looked down. I'm his masterpiece, created to do good works. I say that over and over again because so many people don't believe they know all their defects, know all the points the church wants to point out all their flaws and problems. How about we point out to how good our Savior is and how sanctified and how, how holy and accepted he's made us in the beloved that we can now walk up boldly to the throne of grace. Undeserved, we can show right up. We're back then. Oh, can I read this to you? One more and I'm done. I got in here. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Leviticus 16, 2. Let me just go there. And we're done. No, the plane's running out of fuel. Plane. I can go all day. I can go all day. Did I say 16, 2? Then the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the Aaron's two sons who died after they entered the Lord's presence. Oh, boy. How'd you like that? 
who died after they entered the Lord's presence and burned the wrong kind of fire before him. They showed up, did the wrong thing. And what happened? Then the Lord said to Moses, <laughs> this amazes me, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind a, behind a curtain whenever he chooses. Now, didn't I just not read to you in Hebrews that says you could come boldly to the throne of grace? Did it put a time slot on it? Do you see the difference of how much better we got it? Do you see the difference? I'm here really trying to paint a picture that will set us so much free in our minds and our hearts that we could, you know, Nikolai, we could take whatever that is and breathe and be all excited in the Holy Spirit that we have a living, a living daily, 24-hour, 365-day-a-week relationship with God the Father through the Holy Spirit, redeemed and paid for through Jesus Christ, and we can come boldly to the throne of grace anytime we choose. And it says right here, Aaron says, tell them not to come. Do you see the difference? I'm trying to get to you today. He's not pointing out your defects. He's not coming to get you because you didn't do something 20 or 30 years ago. He just wants you. He just is interested in you. He wants this. Your heart. Your life. He wants to live through you. Not beat you and thump you and drag you around till you get it right. I love it when they all mess up and Paul says, what are you guys doing? You foolish people. Then he just sit down. Let's go over this again. Because when you get it in your heart and you see it, you don't need to tell anybody. Nobody can come and tell you your defects. Because you know that you've been justified and perfected in him. And that, my friends, will set a whole lot of people free and take you off a chain and set you free that you can run and go and do. And it's not for you just to go and do whatever. It's for you to have a living relationship and be a reflection of who God says you are and the position that he's placed you in and the safety that he is that he has given to you. Hallelujah. Boy, that's so exciting to me. And he goes on and goes, tell Aaron, tell Aaron, warn him not to get into the most holy place behind the inner court whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. Aren't you so glad we got it better? Aren't you so glad you got it better? How many would you like to live back then? How would you like to be the one with the defect? Think how you lived the rest of your life. You were labeled a defect. How would you like to be the one going in hoping I don't die? So what I'm trying to get to, to see here where it says Jesus, where it says Jesus is I got my notes. I'm done. Christ came as high priest of good things to come, greater and more perfect tabernacle. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. It's Christ is in you. You are the tabernacle. You are he resides. The Holy Spirit is here to encourage you and to build you up, to strengthen you. Don't be conformed to the way the world does things, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And let the Holy Spirit, let the Word of God tell you who you are. You can come to the, bone of the throne of grace anytime you want. Do you receive that? Oh, I got too many defects, preacher. Too many problems. I hope I make it. You need to start says, I'm going to hold fast to my confession of what he says about me. I'm going to hold fast to my confession when he says about me. When I'm at home, things aren't going, all the things are going on, the bugs in my ear, I'm going to hold fast to what he says about me. There might be a buzz and tell me things don't seem just right, but you know what? I'm going to declare in him it is right. I'm going to declare to him he's going to put me to the right ENT. Ear, nose, and throat doctor that's going to do all, that gives me, knows this the right things to keep me going forward. And they're not going to have to drug me and despair me. I'm going to walk out of there knowing that I've been set free. Knowing that I've been set free. How many here want to live a life that way? How many want to live that life each and day and getting excited about it? He's the high priest of good things that have come in my life. And good things keep coming. They're good and they keep coming. I'm going to hold fast to that confession. Woo-wee, that make you want to shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See the difference we got? Do you receive that? Do you receive that? Do you accept that? Does that excite you? It excites me. It goes, wow. I could do it all over again. Preach the whole thing again because I believe the more we see this, what I just tell you, this is the key to unlocking. This is the key to unlocking that new and living way. This is the key to stability of everything that I do, wherever I go. This is the key to looking past the defects and seeing 
He justifies me. He qualifies me. He set me. He give me the status. He gives me. He doesn't give me church status. He gives me his status. Did you hear that? He doesn't give me church status. He gives me his status. His righteousness. Wow. That just gets me excited. And we get a hold of that. Get excited. Give the Lord praise this morning. Mm. Father, we thank you for this day. And Father, you know the lives in each and every person that is here. Lord, you, you know the people that have tried to live so rough or, or such a life of the, of the blueprint of everything. And Father, I pray today that, that you, will, you, will, you, will, you will rise up into the Holy Spirit and, and show them that not be so focused on the blueprint, but be, so, but be focused on your presence and the relationship that you so desire that you have given us in and through Jesus Christ. And Father, we see that everybody is our neighbor. Everybody has an opportunity to be sons and daughters. Everybody has an opportunity to be saved and set free. You purchased and paid for it a long time ago. Lord, I pray that they will just simply receive the newness of life that's been given to them in Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you in Jesus that we can come boldly to the throne of grace anytime, all the time. Day, night, that you have, that we can draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, that you're not out to get us, but you're out to love us. You're not out to beat us up, but you're out to declare to us that we've been set free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Father, that we'll walk in this world being transformed, not wavering, but declaring that He who promised, is faithful. He who promised is faithful. And I'm going to hold to the confession of what he says about me. I'm going to hold the confession that I have been redeemed, that I have eternal life, that I have eternal redemption, that I'm a son and a daughter. I'm going to hold to the confession that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm going to hold to the confession that Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love has cast out fear. His perfect love has been placed in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I'm going to hold fast to the confession that though I go through the valley of the shadow, yes, I will fear no evil. That he'll put me in green pastures. Comfort me. Mm. That his goodness and mercy shall follow me not just on Sunday, but every day, all the days of my life. Hallelujah. That he forever, sacri- he was forever the one and final sacrifice for our sins. That he remembers, he, he doesn't see my defects anymore. He doesn't see the defects and says, you can't come in. He says, no, you've been justified and set free because you received Jesus Christ and believed on him. Father, I pray that this will be a new day of shift in families and families' families and in relationships and people on, on an individual level and, this, and, and, and on a family level and on a corporate level. That, Father, as we begin to change the way we see this, this paradigm in, 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 in operating and living, that, Father, that transforming of our mind, that, Father, we'll see the fruits and the manifest of, of how good and how great and how awesome you are in every area of our lives. Oh, Father, I pray that you give my brothers and sisters a confidence and an assurance this day that they'll hold fast to the confession of what you say about them. Not what the church says about them, not what the world says about them, but what you say about them, what you declare over them. I thank you, Father, that they're blessed coming and going, that they're the head and not the tail, that they're above and in, in, they're above only and never beneath, that everything they put their hand to prospers because of Jesus' obedience, death, burial, and resurrection. I thank you, Father, that they're fruitful and they multiply in every area of life. I thank you for peace, wisdom that is only found in Jesus. Brings comfort to their homes, comfort to their relationship, comforts to their, their grandchildren and their children's children and all of their, even down to the simplest little things of getting gas. Lord, whatever it is that, Father, you give them comfort and a new outlook on life this day. And we just simply give you praise and we give you glory. And we thank you. We thank you. Church, I just want you to close your eyes and just thank him 
for that new and living way that's been given to you in Jesus Christ. Just thank you, Father. I thank you for the new and living way that you've given me in Jesus Christ. I thank you. Just begin to thank him. He, doesn't, he no longer sees defects. He no longer sees, sees the, he no longer says that you cannot approach. He no longer says that you're going to die. He says because you lived in Jesus, you will live and have life eternal. And Lord, I thank you that the abundant life through you begins to rule, begins to operate, begins to manifest now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. time. Do you enjoy church today? I've enjoyed. Thanks, brother.